Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation to talk about sustainability in aquaculture, especially in the shrimp culture, which is one of the most relevant issues of our days. My name is Marcela Salazar, and I am the chairman of the Animal Welfare Committee for Benchmark PLC. As you know, Benchmark was founded more than 20 years ago with the aim of improving sustainability in aquaculture through the development of products and services in the areas of genetics, animal health, and nutrition. We try to have a real impact across the value chain, and we want to work with all the stakeholders of the industry to be able to reach sustainability. Sustainability awareness has been increasing in the past 20 years, driven mainly by the importance of the antibiotic use they talk about habitat destruction, biodiversity loss, mangrove deforestation, animal welfare issues, which is the new player, disease, contamination by emissions and effluents. And the problem with aquaculture feed supply, the competition of the products that are being used for aquaculture, but also that can be used for, for feeding humans. So it's the competition of the resources between aquaculture and the human consumption. In this presentation, I'm going to walk through the shrimp value chain and discuss some of the relevant issues for each of the links. Starting with the breeders, in the last year, the availability of genetically improved Peneus banamei has been one of the main drivers for the expansion of the shrimp culture in Asia. Animals that are safe in terms of disease risk and adapted to intensive and super intensive conditions are driving the production of the culture to levels never expected. However, there is a downside to that, and it is the effect of the trade on the environment. In the larvoculture link, I will show the increase of using probiotics and the decrease in the use of antibiotics. In nursery and grow out, we'll discuss the benefits of intensification and the need to find clean energy technologies. In the harvest and processing plant, we'll discuss animal welfare and social welfare issues, while on the market chain, we'll talk about customer choice and the barriers for small farmers. The customer is the end and the beginning of the chain. When we talk about customer and sustainability, we have to talk about PCE, which is perceived customer effectiveness, meaning how the customer believes that his actions will have an impact. Customers with high PCE are aware of the importance of sustainability and therefore willing to pay more for a collabed shrimp. It is important to increase customer awareness and create incentives for the sustainable production of shrimp. Regulators, retailers, and investors are also key players in the race for shrimp sustainable culture. European and United States retailers are leading the trend of only selling sustainable certified seafood. The trend started in the Northwestern Europe and the Northern countries, and it's been moving towards the southern and eastern countries, and even to the United States. In terms of capital allocation, ESG issues, environmental social issues, are being taken into account more and more for the investment companies. In 2006, only 63 investment companies were looking to incorporate ESG issues into their investment decisions. And at present, more than half of global asset owners are currently implementing or evaluating ESG consideration in their investment strategy. And now, let's talk about the animals in the value chain. As I mentioned before, the availability of genetically improved Peneusaname SPF spear animals are improving performance, are safe, control diseases, and allow intensification. There is a huge global market for breeders, and it was estimated that in 2019, more than a million breeders were shipped from America, eh, from Texas, from Honolulu, from Thailand, to Vietnam, India, China, and Indonesia, among other countries. Do we know the impact of the breeders' trade on the environment? When we ship shrimps, we ship water and thousands of PEP boxes. One gram of shrimp needs more or less 40 grams of water for the shipment. That means that if we ship 1,000 breeders from Honolulu to Chennai, which is a little bit more than 12,000 kilometers away, we'll be producing 11 
0.46 tons of CO2. And how can we work around that issue of shipping breeders? Well, we can start by carbon offsetting. It will be around $100 to $200 per shipment that can be used for the increased sustainability of the industry. We can also optimize the shipment of animals, decrease the amount of water and increase the number of animals. And we can set up multipliers sending PPLs instead of big breeders. What happens with the boxes? PEP boxes are excellent for shipping, but are really, really bad for the environment. They end up everywhere. It takes hundreds of years to be degraded and they are not easy to recycle. So we have to start looking for new solutions, cardboard boxes that could be recycled. We cannot reship boxes, so we have to be creative on that aspect too. Let's move now from the big animals to the small animals and talk about the hatchery part of the chain. Antibiotics were considered the panacea for the shrimp culture for some years, and they were widely available. However, the rise in antibiotic resistance has been putting a stop to that practice. There are some antibiotics, such as chloramphenicol and nitrofurans, that are completely banned from the uh, shrimp industry, sh couldn't be used. And although, as we can see in this graph, the number of shrimp refusals in the UE border due to finding those residues it's been markedly decreasing since the year 2009 for nitrofurans and 2002 for chloramphenicol. There are still shipments in where we can detect. So we have to be aware of that and we have to find solutions. Why are we so concerned about antibiotic use? Well, antibiotic resistance is a fact, not a myth. It causes more than ten, tens of thousands of deaths every year and more than millions of hospital extra days of patients that were infected with resistant bacteria. What can we do then? What's the toolbox that we have to combat infections? Well, we have probiotics, we have phage therapy, we have prebiotics, and we have nanotechnology. And the use of those products has been increasing with excellent results. Most of the farms now cannot dream about living without probiotics. And phage therapy is having a comeback for, for human treatment, but also for aquaculture. And nanotechnology is being widely used now in diagnosis and can, can be used in water purification, vaccine delivery, and treatment delivery. So those are emerging technologies, or not emerging technologies, because some of them are quite old, but technologies that we have to have in mind and that we have to use to be able to have disease-free environment without using antibiotics. The use of probiotics and other technologies have been increasingly growing in the past years. Probio probiotics have evolved from being short shelf life to long shelf life, from needed to be activated to come in directly in high concentration and be directly applied. They are reliable now. They are specifically designed for aquaculture, for new pathogens, and they are efficient. And that trend in the use of probiotics is also reflected on the number of publications and research that are being done of those topics. I uh, searched at the number of publications on shrimp and probiotic in the title, and I found that it had increased for around two in the decade of 1990s to the 2000 to more than 17 or 80 in the five last in the past five years. Now I'm going to talk about what happens with the grow out and the nursery stages. If we talk about shrimp culture, some people will always talk about mangrove destruction and mangrove deforestation. It is a fact that the shrimp culture region overlaps with the mangrove habitat. And it's also a fact that shrimp culture was one of the main drivers of mangrove deforestation at the beginning of the culture. We have to say that although mangrove deforestation is still a problem, the tides are changing. In the past years, it's been a marked decline in the percentage of area destroyed, changing from 2% in the 1980s to 1990s to less than 0.3% in the last uh, in the decade from the 2000 to 2012. It's been acknowledged in the last 
nature reveal that the habitat conversion by shrimp farming in mangrove has declined markedly, markedly since year 2000. The decrease in the mangrove deforestation has been driven by the evolution of the shrimp culture, moving from the extensive farming using huge ponds located exactly on the mangrove regions to intensive and super intensive farming in smaller ponds, higher production that can be even located inland. Those ponds can have higher productivity and increase predictability, decrease the use of chemicals and antibiotics, um, are under complete control conditions. With the evolution from the extensive to the intensive and super intensive cultures, the need for energy and for aeration and control conditions is increasing. We have to take into account that shrimp culture is located in the tropical belt where we have access to solar energy and wind energy, and we have to harness the potential of those two sources to be able to be totally sustainable. There is a nice project, a cooperation within Germany and Vietnam, uh, designing ponds covered with photovoltaic cells that are not only control the environment, but that will also give all the energy that is needed for the production. So we have to look at new sources, renewable sources of energy. We need a reminder of why we need green energy. Just have a look at what happened this year. We had an unprecedented heat wave in Canada and North America that killed more than a hundred people and more than a billion intertidal animals. We also had the floods in London, in China, in Belgium, and in Germany. So we have to work on sustainable energy for the shrimp farm. In the link of the harvest processing plant, I'm going to talk about animal welfare. Animal welfare is defined as the quality of life as perceived by the animal itself. And in the shrimp world, we tend to associate animal welfare with survival. Well, animal welfare is much more than survival. It takes into account the environment that the shrimp are in, how we handle them, how we harvest them, how we take samples for diagnosis and experiments, do we ablate them or not, and the, that's the group of things that will give us animal welfare. And we need indicators of animal welfare for the shrimp industry. We need indicators for the operations. We need, we need indicators for the lab practices that are life stage specific, species specific, and that are fit for the purpose, and that are simple to use. If we talk about animal, we'll also have to talk about social welfare. Social welfare in the shrimp industry has been improving in the past years, and it's one of the main results of the certification programs. Surveys show that the main uh, gains of certification programs are related to the welfare of the employees and the improvement in the employment conditions. And as we can see in this picture, the, the number of certified facilities uh, with, with one of the programs with best aquaculture practices has been increasing the past years. We have to combat the bad press that we have in terms of shrimp labor and slavery, and we have to show the improvements in social welfare, because shrimp culture is one of the main generators of employment, especially in the processing plants. Reaching sustainability in the shrimp industry is more, much more complex than, for example, in the salmon industry. The shrimp industry is composed of a wide spectrum of producers, environments, moving from the small farmers to the medium, small companies and large companies and integrated producers that can export billions of dollars a year. And we have to find ways to include all of them in our practices and in the, in the road to sustainability. For reaching sustainability in the shrimp culture, we have to learn to work together. We can be competitors in selling shrimp, in selling breeders, we can be competitors in selling services or feed or other solutions, but we are not competitors in sustainability. We have to work together. In this past year during the pandemic, all of the main journals in medicine, uh, Cell, uh, Nature, Science, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, 
decided to publish all the work related on COVID and SARS-CoV-2 for free and make it available to all of the academia and the, the users. So we have to do the same. We have to share the best practices for sustainability and we have to work to communicate the good work and the improvements. We have to define the issues that must be improved and we have to include the small producers. We have to think outside the box and we have to be aware that we're improving, but we can and we must do better. Some of the key issues that we can work to improve sustainability in the shrimp industry can be found in the FAO guidelines for securing small scale fisheries, and that can be also applied to aquaculture. Some of the most important that I think are, for example, to tackle unnecessary institutional and regulatory barriers that are a limit to regulating and including small producers. We have to improve access to credit, finance and insurance, especially in the small scale sector. We have to encourage the recognition of the role of small scale fisheries in livelihoods, food and nutrition to millions of people globally. And we have to ensure that all actors along the value chain have the capacity to get the opportunities and get the share of benefits and engage in sustainable and equitable food systems. Uh, we can reduce the digital divide. We have to invest in mobile data collection and the use of remote sensing technologies. And we have to involve the communities, including the women and youth, and empower them with services. Those that apply to small scale fisheries will also perfectly apply to aquaculture and to shrimp. Sustainability of the shrimp industry and aquaculture industry is directly related to the sustainable developmental goals of the UN and all the work that we do in terms of social welfare, animal welfare, preservation of ecosystems, uh, food security, will contribute directly to the, reaching those developmental goals. Thank you very much.